I'm just going to share for a few minutes, then Jane's going to come and, uh, and do most of what we believe God wants to say and do. We're going to tie up this morning's message with the last couple of weeks of us being in Israel and then Jane being in Poland the last uh, few, well, since last Sunday to Thursday. Um, the book of Romans, the whole, the whole book is Paul teaching about having a righteousness, being made right with God through faith, through what God has done, not by anything we can do. And this morning, you know, the amount of scripture that Jen used at the beginning and then that we've just heard during the worship, even the worship's just full of truth. Why? Because God is the truth. And the truth is so much more powerful than the facts, than circumstances. And in chapter 4, Paul begins to speak about Abraham, the father of faith. And it says that he was credited with righteousness because of his faith. What does that mean? Because when God spoke, he believed what God said. And God is the initiator of faith. I just want to use a few verses before Jane comes to speak to give context for what She's going to share and then maybe I'll just pick up on right at the end and we respond to this morning. Um, God called Abraham, took hold of a man. God's called you and I and he's taken hold of you and I as people. Then he takes us on a journey. This journey is a relationship with him. And in that journey, he speaks, he reveals who he is, he shows us who he is. So that in like any relationship, the more you walk with somebody and you open up your heart and life, the stronger the trust and the bond gets between you. And it's the same in this relationship with God, that as we walk with him, we hear his voice, he reveals who he is. There's a trust, but there's also in this trust a faith that grows in us, a dependency on him, knowing who he is. And so God begins to speak to Abraham and Abraham responds with a yes. Now, God speaks to him and says things to him that in the natural are impossible for him to fulfil. Firstly, he's too old to have kids. His wife is too old. She's past the age of childbearing. God speaks to him and says that he's going to be the father, not only of a son, But God's going to give him a son and from that son, a whole nation is going to be born, a nation of people. But then he also promises that he's going to be the father of the nations. So God speaks into death. God speaks into a barrenness. God speaks into an impossibility. And in that impossibility, when God speaks, he speaks life into something that cannot bear life. And because God speaks life into that, it replaces death or whatever's going on and then life is going to come from something impossible. See, this is what God's life does. This is what God's Word does. This is what happens when we... When God speaks and He gives that revelation of His Word and faith, something, comes to life on the inside of us. And that life begins to replace whatever is going on, whether it's the facts of a situation, the circumstances that we're in, a diagnosis that we've been given. And so God releases faith into that moment. But God is interested in more than just that moment. What he's interested in is our relationship with him, our walk with him and what that, where that faith is going, where this life is going with him and whatever he wants to do through your life or through my life as we walk with him. And so it describes Abraham in this way. David in Romans 4 verses 6 to 8. It says, David says the same thing, that when he speaks of the blessedness of the man whom God credits righteousness apart from work. So let's not go there now. Blessed are are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man who 
who sin the Lord will never count against him. So we understand, firstly, that whatever God has done in our lives, we don't deserve any of it. But also we haven't caused any of that to take place. It's what he has done. All we've done is responded to what God said and his goodness. But God wants to take Abraham on a journey and, and he calls Abraham the father of faith. And so God initiates something through Abraham's life that gives us an example of how somebody walks by faith with God in the impossibilities of the situation, but yet God comes good and fulfills his promises to him. Now, sometimes there was a gap between God speaking and it being fulfilled. But what does it say? It says that, that Abraham's faith didn't waver through what was not seen. But actually his faith was strengthened as he continued to walk with God through that. And we'll come to that in a couple of moments. A couple of verses then. Hebrews 11 verse 6. It says here, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So two things there. One, when you don't know God, when you're out of relationship with God, you've never surrendered your life to Him, there's no way you can please Him because there is no faith in operation in your life. You cannot please Him because you're outside of Him. But then when you do respond and you give your life to Him and you surrender to Him, the Bible says here, without faith it is impossible to please God. So God brings us into a life with Him that is impossible for us to live without Him. <laughs> don't you love that? Yeah. He, it's impossible to please Him when you don't know Him and it's impossible to please Him when we do know Him. Yeah. Because what does it then say in Hebrews 12? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus because He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Don't you love that? Yeah. God brings us into relationship with Him that is impossible to live in our own strength. But He says, don't worry because what I'm going to do as you walk with me, I'm going to author my life in you. I'm going to author faith in you. I'm going to perfect what I've put already in you, my life, so you know, learn how to live that life. All you need to do is fix your eyes on me. Because stuff is going to happen in life that wants to take your eyes over there, over here and over wherever to take your eyes off me, to stumble, to fall, to, to whatever, in whatever way. But yet he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, in that context, then, if God's the author of faith and he's the perfecter of faith, God is unshakable. He's immovable. He never changes. He is sure and certain, right? So what does Hebrews 11 one say? Now, faith, faith is a relationship with God. It's not just something that we have. Faith is a relationship with God. What we believe, we speak. And what we believe, we actually do. We might know some things, but until we are speaking them or living them, it's knowledge, not revelation. And so God wants us to live in the revelation, the truth. He wants us to know the knowledge of, as in the, re the living reality of. So what does Hebrews 11 one say? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So it speaks about Abraham here. He didn't know exactly how it was going to work out or how it was going to happen. But God spoke, he believed and he said that was credited to him as righteousness. So God has made you or not me righteous in his sight, but then he wants us to live in that righteousness. How do we do that? By keeping our eyes fixed on him, hearing what he says to us, the author's faith. And as we walk according to what he says, we live out that righteousness that he has placed in us, Amen. that right standing with him. Then what does it say in Romans 10, 17? Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. That's where he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. So God doesn't want us to try and get faith from somewhere in situations. The best thing for us to do is be totally honest with God in situations. And if we don't believe, say, God, I don't believe. Yeah. Or I'm afraid or I'm anxious. I don't, I've got no idea. I don't know. The best thing is be honest and say, God, would you come in this context of my unbelief, fear, anxiety, whatever. And as I choose to fix my eyes on you, 
I thank you that you then speak because I can't get faith myself. You author faith because that's who you are and that's what your word says. And then God speaks and something begins to happen on the inside of us. So let's have a look at Romans 4, 17 to 25. It says here, as it was written, I've made you, this is to Abraham, the father of many nations. Then it says, he is our father, this is Abraham, in the sight of God, in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead, I love this bit, and calls into being the things, uh, uh, calls into being things that were not. So this is what God does. He speaks things that are not as though they were. That's what faith does. So this life of faith is not what we see. It's what we hear that then becomes seen on the inside of us because we've heard something. And then when you believe, you speak it, you declare it like this. And then we're speaking things that are not as though they were. Now, what we're saying is we're not making things up. We can only do that when we know this is what God has said. So why do we pray for the sick? Because we're we're, we're releasing something that is not as though it were. Somebody's not well. The facts are they're not well. They're sick, whatever's going on. So the factual reality is somebody has a sickness in their body. But the truth reality is I am the Lord who heals you. I'm the Lord, your healer. So therefore, what are we doing? Father, what is it you're saying in this situation? Now we know he is the healer. And therefore, in a situation, we meditate. and, And if we're not in a place of, I don't know if I can receive my healing. I don't know if God will do it for me. The best thing is to say, God, I don't know. I'm not there. Or any other need, any other scenario in your life. God, I'm not there in this situation. The best thing is to come to him and say, God, I'm not there and allow him to then speak or you take hold of the word and you meditate on some scriptures in relation to whatever the area is. And then God begins to do something and author faith in you. Then what comes out of your mouth instead of I don't believe is, Father, I thank you for your healing power at work in my body and something begins to change. But this is what we do when we pray. Why do we pray about anything? We only pray about the things that are not happening, that are not yet a reality. We don't pray for things that have happened We thank God for those and we never pray for something that we already have because you've got it. So what are we doing? Prayer is about bringing into the physical reality what is a spiritual reality. And so prayer is connecting what has been released in heaven already to then be released on earth. That's the prayer of faith. That's why when we pray, it's like, Father, what are you saying? So that then I pray what you're saying into the situation that it changes. So all this has to have an outworking. So verse 18 of Romans 4. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact we, all, we want to face the facts. Let's not shy away from the facts. We're not, we're not put your head in the sand, Christians, right? If the facts are facts, let's say, right, these are the symptoms in my body or this is the need in my life or this is what is going on here. You're right, let's face them, okay? So then we know he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and, his, and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet... He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory, or gave thanks to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he'd promised. That's why it was credited to him as righteousness. That's why in the face of things, it's like, Father, what are you saying? Now, there's a, there's a, there's a journey to this. There's a walk with this that we're on as kingdom faith, a faith walk in all of our lives individually, together as a church, And we just want to share some things from the last couple of weeks in this context of a walk of faith. We not only speak things that are not as though they were, we live in a way because we believe things in here, we move towards things that are not as though they were. So the way we live People who don't live in the way we do can look at the way we live and say, why'd you do that? Because I don't see the evidence of it. 
But we know there's a living reality, so we move towards things. It's the same in in your workplace, in your home, in your family life. Even in your workplace, there can be things that God wants to speak to you about that might be a journey of faith in the workplace. Where something needs to change in your work environment. Or, you know, you might head up a department or you might run your own business and there's things God has spoken to you about and you know that God's going to have to come good to see those things fulfilled, whatever they may look like. And so there's a walk here. There's things that God speaks into our life. So one of the things for us as Kingdom Faith, as a people, is this whole journey to do with Israel and uh, the Jewish people. And God spoke to us in 2005 um, and and gave us a mandate as a church to, in, in regards to Israel. And when we talk about Israel, it's not just a modern political state. We're talking about Israel as a nation, a place, and the people. And the people are Jews, but they are also Arabs. Because there are Israeli Arabs, there's others in that land. And God's heart is Jesus died once and for all. Right? His heart is no matter what race, nationality, background, whoever people are, he died once and for all. So our heart is for people, not just some nation, um, okay, in and of itself. And God spoke to us and and gave us a mandate. And he said, I've called you to be a lead boat in this nation in regards to Israel and to bring a biblical understanding to the church in the nation. Now, we didn't have a clue what that meant then. And obviously for us, we've been on a journey for 17 years, understanding more what that looks like and taking loads of people there over the years, groups and uh, uh, of different people. We took a leaders trip a few weeks ago and... (coughs) different church leaders because God is unfolding something. Now, it's a faith walk because some of the things God said at the beginning, we're beginning to see more of the reality of, but there's still more to come. So it's not just the words we speak, it's the decisions we make and the things we then do in line with what God says that then brings about his purposes. And it's a faith walk. And we don't necessarily understand everything on a faith walk either. We don't have to stand, understand everything from day one because God gives us enough to go with. And as we go, he gives us more understanding as we walk. So on a journey, when you don't understand something, you don't say, well, I don't get that. So forget it. It's all right for Clive and Jane. They get it and a few other people, but I don't. And so don't throw the baby out with the bath, bath water because you, somebody might get something and you're not there yet. Just say, Father, thank you for the revelation of your word and your truth and what you're doing so that I begin to live in the good of this also. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. It's the same with anything in our lives. God speaks. We don't necessarily understand it fully, but we've got to go on this, this faith walk with him and things unfold on the way. And then he proves who he is as we walk with him. So Jane, do you want to come up, mate? And... Um, just share. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, just blown away with what God's been doing this morning. Thank you so much, worship team and Jen. Just amazing, amazing. Just, oh, just meeting, encountering Jesus. We cannot take for granted. We cannot take for granted what we have here. It is so powerful, so powerful. And um, I, uh, there are so many threads from this morning that um, fit uh, into um, where, where I've been the last, where we've been the last couple of weeks. There's so many threads and I, I'm like, okay, Lord, Holy Spirit, just what, what's right to pick up on? Um, so this uh, journey of faith that, that Clive's talking about, Um, where God spoke to us 17 years ago about um, uh, the Jewish people. And and I, um, for me, I had an encounter with God at the the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem on that trip, that first trip. And um, and I've shared this before, um, but God spoke to me and said, will you stand with my people? And... um, I said yes, but I had no idea. I had no idea what that what that would mean and um, what that journey would look like. So you know, we say yes when God asks us something. We might have a battle saying yes, but uh, that's the walk of faith, isn't it? Um, and um, so we've been on this journey of of I would say of of travelling there. And I know people didn't get why I would go to Israel. Why you know, James trotting off to Israel on a jolly again. Blah blah blah. <laughs> But I, ha- I have to do what God's asked me to do. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's right. And um, 
I was building relationships, didn't know where they were going to go, what it was going to look like, um, and um, building friendships, like Clive said, taking tours, taking young people, because we know when you go there, you just have revelation. You have revelation of God, you have revelation of Jesus in a whole new way, you have revelation of a people and a place. God, the, the, the scriptures that we read, you have revelation of, that, of the word, okay? So we have to, we have to go because everything opens up. Romans, uh, God... Paul speaking to the Roman church. Guys, you've got to get this. You are not a church in yourself. You belong to the Jewish people. These are your roots. That's why he wrote Romans and that's why we're reading it. And um, it's so interesting that in over time when, that, when they didn't do that and the Jewish roots, the church was cut off from its Jewish roots, what then Christianity went on to become and then how that impacted the Jewish people over the years. And this trip we, we've just been on, we, we were a week in Israel, um, and a, on a, we were invited to a, a Jewish and Arab conference. So these are Jewish believers in Jesus, Arab believers in Jesus coming together. And that's a miracle. Okay, that's a miracle. It's the blood of Jesus that has broken down a wall of hostility. Amen. Amen. So when you're in the room, you are in this, this, you're not just hearing words, preaches. You are in something God is doing that is so powerful. When they're forgiving one another, when they're honouring one another, when they're loving on one another, when they're praying together, when they're worshipping, God is on the move. Amen. It's so, so, it was such a privilege to be in. And we, some of what we heard this morning about suffering, we heard stories um, of, of suffering, of people choosing um, God in the midst of suffering. Suffering I've never faced, uh, hopefully never will. <laughs> um, people choosing to worship with no hope. People Anyway, I'm not going to go into details. I might do that another time. And choosing to love God and choosing to worship him and honour him in the face of horrible, horrible uh, things. And um, it's interesting because we... So, so much went on in, went on in that trip, the, the Jewish and Arab people together. We heard amazing teaching. We had great times together. We had great conversations. God was doing so much. Um, which is which is why we go. And I was asked to speak, and um, I've been to that that conference before. It's only a small conference. It's a closed conference for people in the land. You might say, well, why why was I there? So a few years ago, I was there with my friend Mary Jane, who lived in worked in the Palestinian areas, and I so I would go along with her when I was over there, and um, and I would see God at work between these people. So Abraham is the father of. Um, uh, Isaac and Jacob, and um, he was the father of Isaac and uh, Ishmael. So we have the Jewish people from uh, Isaac, we have the Arab people from Ishmael, and he's the father of both. He's the father of all peoples, right? So seeing them come together, reconciliation, God wanting his family back is what he's doing, yeah? And so to be in that, um, and then, but then to come and be asked to speak, I completely freaked out. And this is a faith journey, yeah? I sweat. I didn't quite sweat blood. Jesus did that, so I don't have to. But it came close. So speaking in Jerusalem is one thing, but speaking to these guys when they're living something I am not was like, God, what am I, what, who am I, what am I going to say? Honestly, it was so hard to do. And, um, and it, was a, it was a faith, it was part of this faith journey to be standing with them, alongside them. And God gave me stuff to, to say and speak, blah, 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 I did. And um, amazing time. But also, for, straight on from that, I went to Poland. And this, again, came out of relationship. So uh, we got to know the um, deputy chief rabbi here in this nation through stuff that we've done with them and the embassy with the Jerusalem prayer breakfast. And the, this rabbi, he contacted me. This was before COVID. Uh, the trip was supposed to happen initially. And he said, "We're um, so March of the Living is where Jewish people from all over the world go to Poland. 
and they um, visit the different sites, camps, forests, places, places where just unimaginable stuff went on. And sorry. And they go as survivors, as Holocaust survivors there, they go as families who have lost people. And he said, we're having a holy bus of um, peoples that represent different relig religions and would you come representing evangelical Christianity? So I said, yes. So we had two Christians, two Muslims, two Sikhs and uh, about half a dozen rab uh, Jewish people on our bus and about four of them were rabbis. Apart from one, all the Jewish people on our bus had lost people in Poland, had lost family members. And um, it was an amazing, amazing time. And I recommend anybody, and all of you, going, like, go to Poland and just go on um, a trip of discovery of what happened to the Jewish people in the name of Christ on the whole. It was so sobering, so challenging um, to see uh, in Auschwitz, they have a, a new museum area and um, uh, they have this, these pages and pages and pages. It's, it's maybe as wide as this stage, this rack, and on it are pages like maybe this tall, full of names. It's a double rack full of names, every page, and the name of a person, where they came from, and where they died or said death unknown, if they didn't know. So in this room, both of these racks are hanging from the ceiling, and all around are all these young people, because the trip is mainly, much of the living is mainly made, made up of young people. Um, a Jewish community from all over the world. And they're looking, they're looking down, looking down. And I videoed them, looking down for the names of their families that have, that have they've gone, just gone. And like I said, members, members on our bus had lost family members. It was such, um, it was such a privilege to be um, on that trip. Um, to be with them um, hearing them talk about their loved ones. They weren't talking out of hatred. It was very matter of fact. Um, it was um, just a reality of the oldest hatred in the world, yeah. okay, anti-Semitism, yeah. that is still going on. Had a message from uh, one, so we're all on a WhatsApp group, our bus that went, and uh, one of them said today, Lady Rabbi, she was doing... Um, uh, she was out with her son yesterday in London and he was being verbally abused for being Jewish. Just a young boy. So it's going on, it's still going on today. With both these trips, they are what God is doing today. With Jews and Arabs coming together, one new man, it's just a miracle, it's amazing. It's the blood of Jesus we know that can bring us together with people where there has been an age-old hatred with anti-Semitism, I know I'm still processing about this Polish trip, well, both trips, really. Both of them hearing about suffering um, and with the, what was interesting was with, the, with the Israel, you heard more of those that chose God in suffering and in Poland and on my bus were people who lost their faith in God because of suffering. And it's challenging. We heard of, of Christian families that took, that took people in, righteous of the Gentiles, saved Jewish people, and then were killed for it. We heard stories of Christians who were called on to kill Jewish people, and they had a choice. And if, every day we were asked, what would you do? What would you do? What would you do? We had this cricketer with us on our bus. I didn't know who he was, but he, he's... I'm not into cricket. Um, Azim Rakif, I think his name is, Muslim. He was on our bus. He brought up recently in the news um, all the racism that was in cricket, and he's no longer a cricketer because of it. He went through some awful, awful stuff. He was on the bus, 
and he's actually he's written a brilliant article and it's in the Observer today if you want to read it. He was on the trip to learn about the Holocaust and Jewish suffering and um, this age-old hatred that is still going on. But God, you know, God is, God is at work. One of the things I did that God asked me to do in both places at the conference with the Jewish and Arab people, but also um, with our bus, um, was I, I apologised. And I, I, God was speaking to me from Genesis 4, just before I went. Um, I'd been hearing something about God wanting to redeem, God wants to redeem things that have been lost. And, and, and you know, we talk about Genesis and... We've had the Garden of Eden redeemed in one sense in terms of our relationship. We have a walk with the Lord now that was lost through sin, yeah? But we have a walk with him because of Jesus. And I, it set me on this, okay, God, what else would you want to redeem? And I was reading the story in Genesis 4 of Cain and Abel, brothers. And Abel brought an offering to the Lord that, that was from his heart that God accepted. And Cain didn't. And his offering wasn't accepted. And it brought this jealousy it brought jealousy, rejection, anger, hatred to the point where Cain killed his brother. And God says to Cain, um, he says, where's your brother? And he's like, who am I? My brother's keeper? I was challenged when I read it about my own heart. Not just the Jewish people or the Arab people or what's going on in history, but now. Am I my brother's keeper? And he says, um, God says to him, what have you done? He said, his blood cries out to me from the ground. And, um, you know, as Christians, as British Christians, we've been responsible for um, a lot of bloodshed over the years. <laughs> and God was really speaking to me. And so, you know, you could say, oh, you know, did you go with some amazing prophetic word to wherever you were? And it was like, no. God got me to apologise. Yeah. Um, because a lot has been done in, in the name of Christianity in nations. And if God wants to bring reconciliation and bring us back together, it has to start with us acknowledging some things. And not just past, but to live being my brother's keeper. Amen. Amen. Now, everyone around us, are we our brother's keeper? Are we our brother's keeper with what's going on in Ukraine? I know we could give money, and we are, and I thank you, and I just want to ask you to continue to give. Um, we saw loads of them in Poland. The synagogues are just full of stuff. They're just giving away and taking them in and housing them and you name it, it's going on. And I know not just synagogues, other places are doing it as well. But are we our brother's keeper? Are we living or are we living to survive? It's a big challenge, myself. Am I living to survive? Or would I live or lay down my life for someone else to survive? And... Um, this is all part of what God's been saying and doing um, with me. To stand with the Jewish people looks like something. Some things are uncomfortable. Speaking was one of them. That's not the goal, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it wasn't a goal. Um, but it was something God asked. But there's going to be other things. Building friendship and relationship is key to, be, to being reconcilers. Amen. Whether it's them or whether it's your neighbours, whoever God asks you to be reaching out to. Being friends and knitting our hearts together in love is key. It's key to be able to stand with people in the days ahead, the days that we're in. Next Sunday um, in Oxford, there is a, um, I think it's an Oxford Cathedral or something like that. There is a, a Church of England service to repent of laws that the church put in place in this nation 800 years ago, so 1222. Those laws were against the Jewish people. They were anti-Semitic. They caused there and then for Jews to have to wear badges. So it didn't start in Germany. It started here. They were segregated. They couldn't marry. They couldn't 
uh, uh, marry um, non-Jews. They couldn't own anything. That's why they became moneylenders, yeah. where so many evil lies and jokes are made about them. But they couldn't own anything and had to do something. To, and eventually they were expelled. And one of the things that happened all those years ago as well, I think it was in 1144 or something, there was a Christian child that died during Easter for Christians, but Passover for the Jewish people. He went missing and was killed, and the Jewish people were accused of killing him and using his blood for their Passover uh, wine and bread. And it was a lie that caused them to be killed here, went out, caused them to be killed in Europe. It went out and caused them still being attacked in the Middle East because that lie, is called the blood libel, still is going around the earth and it started here in this nation. And the, the church in this nation are actually acknowledging what was put in place, the laws to, um, that were anti-Semitic, and they're repenting of them. And that's massive for this nation. It is massive for the church to repent. What's interesting is it's now it's the Anglican Church who are our state church who are acknowledging it, but the church at the time was Catholic, mm. and their edicts came from Rome. Yeah. And we're reading the book of Romans, yeah. and they didn't listen to it. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So this meeting next week in Oxford is really important. It's being done with Jews and uh, Christians together. That repentance is, is because when we, when we bless the Jewish people, we're blessed, when we curse them, we're cursed, right? We know that. from That's what God said to Abraham. Whoever blesses you is blessed. Whoever curses you is cursed. And I believe there's going to re release fresh blessing on this nation when this act of repentance from the church happens. Amen. Amen. And um, I had a, a picture when we were praying into this last, last year. Um, I, had, I saw a, a riverbed that was all dried up and at the bottom of the riverbed was, was silt um, that was all just piles of it and there was no water running. And I saw a shovel just shoveling away this silt and uh, water started to come. And uh, the verse that uh, the Lord gave me was in, I think it's in Acts 3. Uh, yeah, Acts 3, I think. Uh, Repent, therefore, that times of refreshing may come from his throne, even his, his presence or even Christ himself. Words like that, anyway, you can never read. Um, but I believe that as this repentant happen, repentance happens, we're going to see a fresh release of God, the Spirit of God in our nation. Amen? Blessing and not cursing. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing at this time. I am fully convinced that the promise of God for Jew and Gentile coming together, for his brothers coming back together, God wants his family back, and for the Jewish people to see, somehow see their saviour. And after having spent a week with them, I'm, it's even more of a miracle. And I know I've got to dig deep in God because a lot of them don't believe in him. They're culturally Jewish. They don't believe in God. They've, they've, they've suffered too much. And I just pray that through our love and our walk with them and standing with them, it's going to help lead them and open their eyes to Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I think, um, like with this area, it's, I think sometimes I, I've had people say to me, well, what's this got to do with the local church? It's great if you guys have got a vision for this and you're buzzing with that or whatever, but what's it got to do with the local church? Well, it's got everything. Because there's only such a thing as the local church. So wherever you go in the world, you can talk about what God wants to do in the nation, in the church, in the nation, but it has to be worked out in a local church. There, there aren't certain parts of the Bible that are for some group of people somewhere that are working nationally, and then there's other bits of the Bible for the local church. Um, believers live somewhere, and they've got to be connected into a church somewhere, and the Word of God, all of it is relevant to every place where we are. And obviously, it has to, there's a revelation side to what what God is doing, and um, and we might 
I don't know, we'll have a think about it, do another point where if people want to hear more about the trip and more stuff, the teaching or whatever, then we'll set another side and people can just come. Um, this is so, so important. But one of the things while we were away, uh, when we were in Israel, um, it was just so humbling. So humbling spending time with these people. There were people from from different nations around the Middle East. We won't say where they were on the internet, but they were from different nations around the Middle East all meeting together. And and you just... And none of them are, none of them are um, uh, wanting us to feel sorry for them, is there, Jane? There's, there's no kind of like, can you feel sorry for us or anything? They're not like that. They're just living so much in the reality of who God is, where they are, and in their lives. It's humbling how they, what they're doing and how they're living. And um, now we have different challenges. So it's not about comparisons, but we have different challenges here. Um, there aren't the same pressures here uh, that they face that, that it's either life or death. If you're going to follow Jesus, then I could be in jail tomorrow or even killed. Uh, we might not we face that. Um, but there's other pressures that we face called the spirit of this age that just want to compromise our hearts and minds, you know, take our eye off Jesus, get into this, that and the other. And so there's different. There's a different challenge for us to plug into God and to pursue God, you know, than, than they have. Um, but just just humbling our, uh, their heart for God and, and for people and, and what God's doing. So let's just stand, shall we? We'll just pray for a moment. There's a couple of practicals just before we, we close this morning. Just think about your life for a moment. Maybe you know what God is saying to you or has said to you or the journey that he's taking you on personally. Maybe there are people around your life, friends, family, work, colleagues, neighbours, people that God has put on your heart to reach out to. It's, that's a faith walk. There might be other scenarios. I don't know what it might be to do with your work life and, and there's things God's been speaking to you about that. And in the midst of those challenges, we it's like, Father, I want to fix my eyes on you. I want to keep my gaze on you so that I walk this in the way that you want me to. Believe what you want me to believe and act in the way you want me to act. Because the enemy wants to put fear, anxiety, worry, it's impossible, don't be silly, you're stupid. All of that in front of us to put us off. They're not going to be interested, you're never going to see that happen. All of that. Because that's, that's his job. That's what he does. And God authors faith to not just get us out of the situation, but to allow us to come through it, to see his victory and his breakthrough. So, Father, I thank you that your words are living and active. They're life to us. We thank you that you continue to author your faith in us, in our lives. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're in us to, to enable us, to help us, to take a hold of you, to fix our eyes on Jesus. When the going gets tough, or even if the going's not tough, we're just in that relationship with you. We don't even want to do when things are flowing and things seem to be going great, then we, we don't want to go into our own strength either in that. So Father, we thank you for the, that flow of your spirit in our hearts and lives. Maybe just ask the Lord to continue to work in your heart to do with people that don't know Jesus, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Arab, whether they're Gentile, no matter who they are. I mean, Arabs are Gentiles. There's only Jew or Gentile as far as God's concerned. But for people... Father, would you continue to work in my heart towards those that are around my life that don't know you, that live a different way, think differently, act differently, have a different lifestyle. Father, I don't want to be, I want to be a person of grace where I'm not condemning, judging or criticising, but I'm coming with, with love. And Eric spoke about that last week, God's love in us. If you haven't heard it, I encourage you to listen to that. So, Father, I just thank you. Keep working in our hearts as a church, as a people. 
so that your promises are fulfilled through our lives. Thank you to keep all three in faith so that we live out who and what you've called us to be and to do. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.